you have made it to the final class on why I'm not an agnostic. And it's taken me a while to get us through that door, but I hope that we're going to be through that door as of the end of today. An agnostic, of course, being someone who can't decide whether there's sufficient evidence for God when weighing it against the evidence that there is no God. And so we've looked at it uh, in in those terms and in that way it's wonderful to have all of these lawyers that are, are running for judge or already sitting as judge in here today they can tell you courtrooms all around the country for hundreds of years we prove matters by the greater weight of credible evidence if we're in a civil court and it's the general rule or sometimes it's something more it might be beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal case but the idea of proof is not simply going to a chalkboard with a mathematical f formula. It's not a science lab experiment. Those work marvelously well for science and math. But if we're going to prove whether or not we love someone or how much uh, 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 we love them or, or what uh, has happened historically, who ran the red light or who killed who, we're not going to be able to do that in a laboratory reproducing the experiment. That type of proof is done by weighing the evidence, assessing its credibility, and deciding how that evidence unfolds. So that's what we've been doing, and that's what we'll finish with today. And in the process of that, I was thinking through my introduction as I was writing the lesson this week, and recognizing I'm writing these while I'm in trial in Dallas. And so it's, it's kind of, a, an, it, it, it makes it, I'm very focused legally while I'm writing these lessons. And I realized this week something that you all know. Emails are a blessing and a curse. I am now advocating, this, I'm going public, first time today, politicians, although if you're running for judge, you don't really have a platform other than truth, justice, and the American way. But, uh, Roberts, you can put this as like one of the things, if you get elected to, to make a law. You know how we've got holidays? We've got President's Day. We've got uh, Valentine's Day. We've got uh, 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 Father's Day, like the most important day of the year. We've got all of these different holidays. I'm ready for a new one. You ready? Email free day. A day where we just recognize you shouldn't be writing emails and you have complete amnesty for not reading any emails that day. One day a year where we can say no to emails. Emails are a blessing and a curse. The, the, the curse is they're there all the time and you just can't get out from under them. The blessing is... Uh, uh, they're there all the time. And so you don't have to be calling in constantly. You, you don't have to be one place constantly. It allows you to be mobile. I'm in trial right now, and they're a huge blessing to me in trial because, bless this defendant's heart, they memorialized many things in emails they wish they hadn't. I'm having a good time with some of their emails. You know, but emails are interesting. We've got all sorts of emoticons and fonts. We can put something in bold. We can put exclamation marks. We can emphasize things. But nobody's figured out a sarcasm font. So if you're writing something sarcastic, be very careful because the person reading it might not know it's sarcasm. It's like so much of what we read on the Internet. I remember the first time someone sent me an article from The Onion, and I thought it was real. And I didn't realize that The Onion, America's finest news source, is all satire. And it's all made up. So, I mean, if you got on it the other night, Paul Ryan sitting among undecided voters at town hall debate. That's not real. Don't email that around to your friends. It's, it's, it's fun. Now, this satire, we should know what it means. Sarcasm, we should know what it means because we learn early in life in school about different types of literature. We learn what's fact and we learn what's fiction. And, and even in our school libraries, these books over here are fact. These books over here are fiction. And so we learn about those types of things. But we're really learning about them for a 21st century, or for many of us it was a 20th century, mindset. The problem is reading the Bible. 
Because the Bible is a collection of books and letters and poems that were written over a period of over a thousand years. And so when you read the Bible, not, not only written over a thousand years, but written 2,000 years ago and more. Parts of it over 3,000 years ago. And so when you sit there and you try to read, and, and that's not good enough either. None of it was written in English. None. You've got Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament. You've got Greek with a Latin word or two in the New Testament. And an Aramaic word or two in the New Testament. The written in the Greek language. And so you, you've got different languages in different cultures in a different mindset with a different literary history that even within itself is not consistent. And when you read the Bible with all of these different types of literature, some of them are common today. But some of them are totally foreign to us. How many of you in your academia learned chiasm as a literature type? Unless you studied ancient Near Eastern literature, I doubt you did. But chiasm was an extremely important literary tool. We've been taught when you want to emphasize something, you either put it at the beginning, journalism majors, you don't bury your lead, or you put it at the end. But with chiasm, the emphasis is what's on the middle. Very different than our way of thinking. So when we go back to the Old Testament and we start reading it, one of the big chores we've got is trying to figure out how to read the Old Testament. Now, one of the biggest claims for atheism is this idea that I started last Sunday about science versus God. And it's typically, is creation real or is evolution real? And so the evolutionists think Ah, uh, I believe in evolution, so there must not be a God. And the, the, the Jew or Christian believer from Scripture says, I believe in the God revealed through Scripture, so evolution must be false. And somehow this schism has developed. And my suggestion to you this morning is that's a false schism. Let me explain why. One of the chores of, of reading a passage of Scripture is not to read it with our mentality necessarily. Now let me give you an easy one. Psalm 113.3 says, From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Now we can look at that as scientists and we can say, well, that's proof right there the Bible's false. Because we have learned the sun doesn't come up and go down. That's just what it seems to do. But we know in our great cosmic knowledge that the sun is staying in the same place. The earth is rotating. So it's when the earth spins around toward the sun till the earth spins away from the sun. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Well, if we are so pedantic you look that word up, it fits. If we, are, if we are so pedantic that we believe that and we're going to look at the Scripture, then heavens, we've lost the beauty of what's being said there. Because that passage is not written to give us scientific insight into the fact that the sun is in some chariot or something that comes up from the east and goes down in the west. That passage is just making a reference to language we still use today. That for all appearances, what the psalmist is saying is, from the day, time your day starts till the time your day ends, praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. So how do we do this? So this claim, I don't believe in God because in the science versus God debate, science should win. I think it's a false claim. I'm putting it in legal terms for our lawyers here this morning. Is it God versus science where that plaintiff's original complaint is going to say, comes now plaintiff God and files this petition against the defendant science? 
Or shouldn't it be, as I would suggest to you, God and science are on the same side against bad theology and bad reading of the Bible? Comes now plaintiffs, God and science, and file this petition against bad theology and bad Bible reading. I think that's what we have. So when we're weighing this evidence for God against God, and we're trying to assess it, here's what we've gone over the last eight weeks. Why is there objective right and wrong? Why is there beauty? Why is justice and fair so important to us? Why is there a basis for dignity and honor? Why do we uniquely value humanity? Why is there meaning and significant in life? Why do my actions fail to meet my standards? Positive perceptions that I think argue, with one exception that I just think is a wash, I think argue for the existence of God powerfully. The realities that we experience that only make sense if there is the Jewish Christian God. And then we looked at the negative perceptions. Why is there suffering if there's a good and powerful God? Why, is, why can't we see him? Why is he not showing up? Why don't we introduce him on a Sunday so you can go up and ask him your questions? Why do so many of my prayers seem unanswered? And then what we're dealing with right now, how does God mesh with science in making sense of the cosmos? Those are the issues. And so as we finish this, I've already talked about the issues that to me seem to make sense and seem to tilt the scales, uh, uh, not just strongly, but, but very strongly in favor of evidence for God. So strongly that I, I just can't, I, I, I can't walk away from it. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have, I, I just can't turn my head against that weighty evidence. So how does God mesh with science and make sense of the cosmos? Where does that sit in the scales? Last week I talked to you about the importance of context for reading the creation story in Genesis. And I want to do that again today. I want to talk about what the Bible is not. The Bible's not a 21st century novel. It's not a modern textbook. It's not a doctoral dissertation. The Bible is many different writing types, poetry, narrative, etc., that span over a thousand years and are set into distinct historical, cultural, and geographical contexts. If we don't understand that, we'll get stuck by how someone from the north can go down south to Jerusalem, and yet Scripture says they go up to Jerusalem. We're like, oh, oh that's wrong. But if we understand geography, we know Jerusalem's on a hill. Doesn't matter where you're coming from, you're going up to Jerusalem. Geography is important. The historical context is important. If we don't consider the historical, linguistic, and there's a missing comma, and cultural context of each portion of the writing, then we're not going to make sense of it where it was originally written. We've got a, a positive and a negative here for our day and age. See, the, the Bible was written in the context and to a specific culture and a specific time. We read it today and the challenge is to understand that culture and context so we can then interpret it in light of where we are today and what we know today. The, 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 the blessing, though, is where we are today is an information-rich world. This is why projects like the Museum of the Bible are so very important. Because they're not just, I mean, you go to the Museum of the Bible when it opens in a year, and I think Carrie will tell you it's not simply going to be, here's every translation of the Bible that ever came. It's got so many other artifacts and so many other documents and, and manuscripts that help inform us of the culture, of the, 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 the societies that have produced these scriptures. So with all of that in mind, let's get to this morning. What does Genesis say about science? Creation or evolution? Well, it depends, Miss Carolyn, on how you read it. It depends on how you read it. Let me make a suggestion to you. We're going to look at Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. It is the first creation account 
that has the seven days of creation. Starting with Genesis 2-4, you have maybe it's a microscope that zooms in on the creation. Some people believe it to be a second creation account. I, I'm not that 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 fuss is a good fuss to look at, and I've given you a lot more information in your handout today than I've got time to present. But I want to zoom in on the first part. Genesis 1 through 2, 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Are we okay? Okay, good. Cool. Um, don't want to get arrested. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This section of scripture reads very differently than that next creation about how God makes Adam and Eve in starting in 2-4. It's kind of an exalted prose. It's got some poetic repetition. Over and over and over it'll say, and God said, and God said, and God said, and there was evening and there was morning and there was evening and there was morning and there was evening and there was morning. And it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. There's a poetic repetition. Hebrew poetry was fond of repetition. It's got a unique internal structure to it. I mean, we, look, we're, how many of you are alive in the 21st century? Most of you. It's a good sign. If your neighbor did not raise their hand, get someone that knows CPR on them now. Because they were alive when they came in here. If we're alive in the 21st century and we are part of Western civilization, which most of us are, maybe not all. By that I mean we've come out of Western civilization as opposed to an Eastern civilization mindset. We tend to read something like Genesis 1 and say, okay, day 1, and then day 2, and then day 3. Well, this is pretty simple. It's as simple as 1, 2, 3. And, and, and you know, we don't say ready, fire, aim. We say ready, aim, fire. 1, 2, 3. You get counted off in kindergarten if you say 1, 3, 2, 4, 7, 9, 8. You got to be able to put them in order. That's a very Western mindset. That's not an Eastern mindset. There's a unique internal structure to those first chapter of Genesis. And we're not reading it fairly if we don't recognize what it is before we decide how we're going to understand it. Let me show you what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bareshit bara Elohim et hashamayim va'et ha'eretz. Va'ha'eretz and the earth. Tohu vabohum. It was void. It was without form. The earth, God creates it, and He creates it without form and void. Now you might be thinking, what? That's a good thing to think. Because what happens is, God then, in the account of the first chapter of Genesis spends three days forming that which had no form. Then three days filling that which he has formed but had no filling. Think of it this way. If you've never been to the potter's wheel and seen Catherine or someone form a pot, you take a lump of clay and you form it. It, it takes form. But you can form the vase, and the vase isn't finished for yours in my house until you fill it with some flowers or whatever you're going to put in it. And that's what happens. So God takes an earth without form and void, and He forms it, and then He fills it. He forms light and darkness. That's day one. He forms the heavens and the waters. That's day two. He forms the earth and vegetation. That's day three. People say, well, okay, all right, I got it. Then he fills. So if he had formed light and darkness and he wants to fill it, what's he fill it with? 
the sun to fill the day and the moon and stars to fill the night. So, you know, I mean, we got people, how can you have vegetation in the earth before you have the sun? How can you have day three before day four? Be gentle here. Don't read it like it was written for you and me right now. It was, but it was written within a context for us to understand in its context. So he fills what he has formed. He formed light, and he fills it with the sun. He formed darkness. He fills it with the moon and stars. Day five, he's got to fill the heavens and the waters. What's he do? Day five, he fills it with birds and fish. Day six, he needs to fill the earth with and, 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 and put something there to handle the vegetation. Eat it. What's he do? He puts animals and people. And day seven, he rests, not because he's tired, but like a musician's rest in music because he's through. So there's a forming and a filling. You see, you, do you see that beautiful and unique internal structure within the story? It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And it reads very differently than the rest of Genesis. So how are we going to understand it? Some people say, I believe it literally. I believe the Bible literally. Okay, well, yes and no. How literal are you going to be? Are you going to say there's artistic numbering? But, oh, one, two, three, four, five is one, two, three, four, five. Eh, 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 eh. That is not the biblical mindset. Those are the same kind of people who look at Matthew and Luke and say, hey, one of those must be wrong. Do you know why? Look at Matthew and Luke. Here's Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is led up. Ah, there we go. Jesus is led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Fast 40 days, 40 nights. And the tempter came and said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Got it? Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, led by the Spirit in the wilderness, 40 days being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and the devil, they were ended, and the hungry devil said to him, If you're the Son of Man, command this stone to be bread. We're good so far, right? Jesus says it's written, Man shall not live by bread alone. All right, bread, bread. Look at the next one. Devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said, I'll give you all of this if you'll worship me. Matthew 4. After man shall not live by bread alone. Devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle and said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. He doesn't offer him all the kingdoms until next. Luke? What about that pinnacle? Ah, Luke's got him offering the kingdoms, and then he goes to the pinnacle of the temple. They switched the order. Now you want to look at it and say, well, one of them's got to be wrong. It only happened in one order. No, don't read it like us. They switched it on purpose. They're driving home themes and points. They're driving home a message. They're not trying to give you a chronology timeline. You'll find the gospel writers change the orders of things a lot to fit their message. It's not because they're inaccurate or poor historians. They're not writing a timeline. They're explaining a message, and when they change order or, or put an order into place, it's for the purpose of the message. So some will say, yes, it's literal. Oh, look, I've got some people who say God spoke Hebrew because it says, and God said, let there be light. And it's got Hebrew words there. So if God said it, he must have been speaking Hebrew. Well, don't go there. I'm going to be literal. No. You can believe the Bible means literally what God wants it to mean without thinking the sun must rise and set. So some will say, I want it to be literal, but I'm going to take it as artistic numbering. Some will say, I'm, I'm literal, but when he talks about a day, he means an age, like the day of King David. Uh, uh, you know, the Hebrew word yom, that means day. 
uh, it also means age. It means time period. It just it means a segment. So you might say it's literal, but if so, how literal? Or there's another way you can read it. You can read it allegorically. You say, ah, no, 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 no. I want to tell you, for a period of time in early Christianity, the concept was anybody can write history. If Scripture is produced by God, it's got to have some authenticity beyond simple writing. Hence, the allegorical understanding as well. And, and uh, uh, Philo, uh, within the Jewish tradition, Philo of Alexandria in the first century, big on allegory. Origin and, and the, the Alexandrian Christian school of thought in the first few centuries, big on an allegorical interpretation. They would laugh at what we debate today. So is it a poetic picture? Is that what it is? Who knows? A third way to read it, and I got to tell you, this is my way, save the best for last, which is always a mistake because I don't have enough time for it, is historical context. Read it within the historical concept. It's not, gee, Israel's going to assert a myth to battle against the other myths. It's a message of Israel's that battles against the other messages. Israel is incredibly different from all of its neighbors in this creation story. It's unlike anything else we ever read. I talked last week about the difference it has about what it says about God, what it says about nature, what it says about humanity. And I compared it, you know, in um, the 1800s, the Nineveh palace was uncovered by archaeologists, and they discovered all of these tablets. The, uh, King Ashurbanipal had this massive library in Nineveh in the sixth, 7th century B.C. It was destroyed around 630, I believe. And all BC and all of these books, which are clay tablets to them, were uncovered. And scientists, our, our, our linguists, had to learn the language to translate them. But from them, we get the Atrahasis, we get the Enuma Elish, we get the other pagan accounts of creation. And they're so radically different than what Israel understood. Radically different. The message of Genesis is that God is one God, not many. He's above creation. He's not part of it. He's not the tree. He's not the thunderstorm. He's not the lightning bolt. He's outside of space and time. He's not caught up in it. He doesn't fall asleep. He doesn't go on vacations. All of which the other gods do in the other accounts. God's not a sexual being. In all of Israel's neighbor's accounts, you have the gods and the goddesses. And they're always chasing each other. And it makes... I, I mean, it, it makes sex in the city look passive. Israel's God is not limited. But the gods share human limitations among the neighbors. Very different message there. Very different message in nature. Nature is not something that... that you know, the gods didn't get tired and make man so that man could dig the irrigation ditches because the gods were tired of working. That's what happens in the neighbor's accounts. But as, as the Jewish Christian scriptures reveal it, nature is made with people in mind. The foodstuffs, the light, the seasons, etc. all come to that pinnacle of creation which is the Zoom story starting in Genesis 2-4 of God making Two humans in a likeness that infuses them with his spirit. I mean, Scripture doesn't even say that there weren't a bunch of other hominids around. There may have been. Australopithecus, just a uh, hunchback crawling down the road. I mean, Cain's going to look for a wife somewhere. But God created, and Adam had a chance to look at a lot of different, I don't think he was shopping for a wife among the raccoons and beavers. But God says, no, for spirit-filled Adam there must be spirit-filled Eve, bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, and spirit of God's spirit. And so within that framework, we've got that. The differences in humanity. For Israel, all the people are made in God's image to be in a relationship with him, living according to God's purposes. But for the neighbors, the king's image 
with the people. It, it, the, the king is made in the image of God. And so the people do what the king commands. Very different stories. So when we read it, before we get to Paul and science, when we read it, we need to understand that if we're looking at the message of Genesis, and that message is there whether you read it literally or whether you read it historically context or allegorically, you don't lose the message. That's some of the beauty of God's scriptures. You can read that almost any way you want. You're going to get the message if you're reading it for the message. So when people come up to me and say, well, I can't be a Christian, I believe in evolution. Or I can't believe in God, I believe in evolution. I just say, so? I mean, I'll be glad to discuss whether or not evolution is valid. And that's a debate that we can have. But I got news for you. We have people in this class who are stalwart, faithful Christians who are fervent believers that evolution is how God made us. Genesis tells us why. This morning my wife came in to me, my sweet Becky, as I'm sitting there putting together the PowerPoint. She says, can I get you some tea? Can I get you some breakfast? And I said, sure, I'd love some tea. And, she, and then I changed. I said, better yet, a diet Dr. Pepper. But let's, the, the analogy works better with tea, so let's stay with tea. So I, I'd love tea, please. And so she went in there and, 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 and on many mornings, not this morning, made me tea. And if you said to me, hey, how'd you get your tea? I could tell you, my wife who loves me so much saw fit to sacrifice her morning to go in there and to make me tea. And that would be the truth. Or I could say to you, well, we've got this gas stove. And on the gas stove, my wife put this kettle that had water. And the heat from that gas excited the electron molecules in the metal, which excited the electron molecules in the water. And they were moving so fast and furious, it produced what we call heat. And then that hot water took the oils from minced up mint leaves and seeped those oils, infusing the molecular structure of the water with flavorings, color, and odor. Uh, there's a difference between the, those two, but that doesn't make one right and the other wrong. So I got to tell you, I don't argue evolution with anybody about whether or not God exists. It's not the debate that's there in Scripture. If you want to believe in evolution, fine. Let me talk to you about God. If you don't want to believe in evolution, fine. I still want to talk to you about God. It's just not, they're not opposite sides of the V, as we would say in a courtroom. All right, I can't let go without one more thing. What does Paul say about God and science? Because Paul writes on God and science too. <clears throat> Paul was a Jewish rabbi, first century, trained at the top. He was the, the rabbi Gamaliel would choose, who, who ran the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court for, for Israel. The rabbi Gamaliel would choose one person to be his chief clerk, if you will. Paul was the chief clerk of the chief justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. He was a really big time mover and shaker who decides after spending a period of time persecuting those people who understood Jesus to be the Messiah, after a time he decides, and a revelation, he decides they were right. And so he's a Jewish rabbi who is what we would call today a Messianic Jew who believes that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. So he goes throughout the Gentile world, not only preaching in the synagogues to the Jews to understand Jesus as Messiah, but also preaching among the Gentiles, the non-Jews, explaining Jesus as the Savior. They didn't understand Messiah. They weren't waiting on the Messiah, but they could understand a Savior. So within the framework of that, Paul's writing to Jewish and Gentile Christians in Romans. And here's what he says. What can be known about God is plain to them 
God has shown it to them. God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Now that is a pro, a, a profound proclamation. Paul is saying that we can look at creation, we can look at the things that are made, and when we look at them, we will have insight into God's divine nature. Wow! You want motivation to be a scientist? Put that in the middle of your refrigerator. Because when you see the wonders of creation, when you understand the intricacies of molecular biology, when you understand the fantastic things of this world and the cosmos, you're getting a glimpse into the depths and wisdom of an almighty God. So what can we say? We can read Paul and understand that God's a cause and effect God. Paul will write and he will say, because they did this, God did that. Because they did this, God did that. You go to Galatians where he says, don't be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever someone sows, that also shall someone reap. God is a cause and effect God. And we can study this universe. And if Paul's right, we're going to see a cause and effect universe. Well, duh. That's a fundamental rule of science. To every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We learned that in school. Don't know what it means, but we learned it. No. <laughs> That's the premise for a jet engine. If it exhausts, pushes the exhaust that way, and the gas is out, Something's got to move that way. God's a cause and effect God. God's a consistent and reliable God. I promise you, you can figure out, or talk to people who can figure out, to the second when the sun will go down today. We can put people on the moon because we know exactly where it's going to be by the time the ship gets there. We don't have to worry we're in Harry Potter world where someone with a magic wand's going to zap the moon and move it just enough to where we miss it. We live in a consistent and reliable world. And I'll tell you something else. We serve a, a, God, a God who is moral and just. And there is, within the fabric of our being, this deep, hardwired sense of morality. Now, yours may be a little different than mine. But we both have a strong moral understanding. There is a morality of right and wrong that exists. Justice is an important concept to all humans. I, mean, I, I told you before, a four-year-old learns to say, that's not fair, because they think fair is right. We're hardwired that way because God is moral and just. We see it in the world around us. So I put all of this stuff in the evidence, and I weigh it all, and I just can't find the evidence going any other way than that there is a God, especially as set forward in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. So with that, let me give you your points for home, and we're done. In the beginning, God. Bareshit, bara, Elohim. In the beginning, God. Tremendous. John will make a play off of that in his gospel. In the beginning, NRK, Hain Ho Logos. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God is at the start of everything. He needs to be first and foremost for you and me, too. He's got to be at the start of not just every day, not just every night, but every minute, every chore, everything we do. Everything we do, we need to have God at the beginning. We need to see God as the creative source behind all of it. Point for home two. And God said, let there be light. And God said. And God said. And God said. And every time God says, it came to be. God still has a word for you and me. 
God's got something for you to hear. He's got a message. And I want, I want my ears to be cleaned out. I don't want my pride. I don't want my busyness. I don't want my desires. I don't want my, my lack of discipline to get in the way of hearing what God has to say to me. Because that's what I want. That's God being first and foremost. And I know when God speaks it and it comes to be that it is good. To which I can only say as he does that in our lives, my life, thank you God. So that's why I'm not an agnostic. And um, next week I want to tell you why I'm not a Muslim. So I look forward to that. Can I bless you real quick before we go? May the Lord bless you and keep you and lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.